So with no further ado, I want to leave you with one thought before you actually get started to the first speaker of the day. And that is that everything that we're going to be discussing is macro. It's big picture stuff. And some people, and I can feel it in my friends, family members, they're, they're getting stressed about all this stuff happening around them. It, it, agree? Yes? Yes. Don't let it get to you. There is nothing you can do about it. What you're doing is already enough. You're learning, right? The only thing that you can control is you. You cannot control the outside. You can learn about it. Don't let it get to you. It's all about you. It's all about moving forward. So now, I have a very interesting human being to present and to introduce. And that is interesting because I haven't actually seen him for about, what, 15 years? So I met him 15 years ago because we did a few events together. Uh, he's also into property investing and, and doing really good when it comes to business and sharing his message. I know for a fact that he's one of the best speakers that you're going to hear about for a long time because he's, he's a great communicator. He's very passionate. He cares, and you're going to feel that right away. Genuine, charismatic, and I'm not going to say anything more because he's going to have to give me a big kiss or a cuddle if I do any more, right? So without any further ado, I want to introduce and welcome to the stage to Mr. Julian Bachelor. Big round of applause, please. Yeah, Come here, mate. Yes. Hey, thank you for coming today because even though David's a fun guy and he's a great MC, uh, for me, this is not a fun topic. Uh, it's a very serious topic. And um, I've left my job because of what's happened and what is happening to New Zealand. And uh, I want to try and stop co-governance. And I want to dedicate the next year until the next election to that cause. Because it's such a serious thing. And I'm seeing New Zealand deteriorating like I have never seen it before. And we can't let this go on like this because we're heading for the cliff. So I want to run seminars between, um, between Invercargill and Cape Rianga between now and uh, the election. Oh, thank you. My goodness. You know, when you say the right thing, the lights come on. That's amazing. All right, this is a sign. So New Zealand, New Zealand's at war. It's not a war against China or Vietnam or the Nazis or anybody like that. We're fighting for democracy, we're fighting for free speech, we're fighting for equality, we're fighting for one vote, one person, every vote being equal in value. And uh, so this war is against, it's fighting for those things, but really it's against elitist Maori, treatyists, people that are different from what I would say is the ordinary Maori on the street, I have friends that are Maori. They don't know what's going on. This is being led by a small group of what I call treatyists or elitist Maori. And so today's presentation is about that. We're going to have to go quite quickly because we don't have much time. And um, uh, I've got 30 minutes. I should love to do a whole day seminar on this because there's so much information, so much you need to know. And the more I've dug into it, the worse it gets. So here we go. So it's 2022 and New Zealand is at war. Um, this is Tiffany O'Regan, the uh, Ngātahu leader. And this quote comes out of a book. It's a very, very good book. You should get it. So Tiffany O'Regan has been known to hint that if the Ngātahu and other claims before the Waitangi Tribunal are not met, there is a danger that Maori activists may resort to violence to achieve their objectives. Um, this is a guy called Ken Mayer. He said this, we will take back our country by any means. And that comes out of the same book. Um, the Maori Party has clear goals. They're in the public domain. That's, that's uh, Waititi. He said this, we have a 25-year plan. They want self-management, self-determination, and self-governance over all their domains. That is education, health, um, prisons, everything. They want a completely different uh, and separate uh, government in New Zealand than the one we have now. Um, they want a separate Maori parliament with 15 to 17 seats and control over $20 billion of annual incoming, uh, income ongoing. So they want the taxpayer to fork out $20, million, uh, $20 billion every year 
to fund this new Maori government. They want the abolition of full and final treaty settlements. They do not want full and final uh, settlements. They want ongoing money. So they have a sort of signed a pact together that they will not accept any full and final payment. Um, they're handing back, they want the handing back of cons all conservation land to Māori. Now when I started reading this, I thought, this is chilling. I've been a Kiwi all my life, I love New Zealand, uh, but I can see something happening here that is, we're, we're heading towards being the, the Zimbabwe of the South Pacific. This is a lawyer, his name is and it's historian Stuart C. Scott, he asserts this, claiming has become an integral part of, Mar of a Maori way of life. The thought of the extinction of further claiming rights by final settlements is abhorrent to the race. Maori does not want settlement. It wants to nurse its grievances and continue its claiming ad infinitum. So what I'm giving you today is quotes from uh, people who are smart, who are clever, who are historians, he's a lawyer, and who's done his research. He's written an excellent book which all of you, I think, should, should read. So what's co-governance all about? I've put uh, Nani Mahuta there because she was one of the architects of Hei Pua Pua, and I want to also give credit to um, the slight information to the New Zealand uh, Centre for Political Research for the information that you're about to see. So what Maori want is this. Two complete governments that overlap, a newly written constitution based on a new interpretation of the Treaty of Waitangi, at least 5% of all new procurement contracts must now go to Maori businesses, all government departments, agencies must now provide a report that shows at least 5% of the procurement of goods and services was from Maori businesses. So Maori businesses are being given special privileges that nobody else has. We have 160 cultures in New Zealand. And Maori want to be singled out as being special. Now we're going to have a look at the Treaty of Waitangi shortly because I want to see that the whole basis of co-governance is fraud and corruption. Which has got me going because how does it feel when you get ripped off? How does it feel when you, when you know you're being shafted? Tell me how that feels. How many have been in business where you feel like you're being shafted? Yeah, you, you do. And you go, this feels awful. I want to I stop this. And I feel New Zealand is being shafted. And I'm a Kiwi. And I want to stop it. Thank you. The more clapping you give, the more wound up I'm going to get. So if you'd like to see me just burst into flames, keep going, please. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's not nearly loud enough. Let's see if you can do a proper one. Come on, all together. Let's have a good one. That's better. Yes. That's much better. Now we're talking. All right. So, the media. Specific guidelines for the media. We all know about the $55 million public information journalism fund which was established by the Labor government. Now, Sean Plunkett, who I love, and his, uh, the platform is radio station, and all he does, he put the, and it's on my website, and you've got a little card that you were given with my website on it. Now, he, he put the documents from this fund, this journalism fund, on, the, uh, on his website. And basically, I'll tell you quickly what they did. During, uh, during uh, lockdown, uh, media outlets struggled to get money. So they, they still had leases, and they still had debts, uh, you know, expenses. And so they incurred debt. Now, Labor government came along and said, we'll, we'll put up this $55 million dollar a fund which was like putting a box of KFC in front of a starving, you know, kids. And uh, they all said, we'd love to get this money. And they said, if you want a slice of the pie, you can have it, but the string's attached. You have to promote the Maori agenda, you have to promote co-governance, and you have to promote any, everything that's Maori. Principles of the treaty, and nobody knows even what the principles are. And so what they did is people who are in debt, media outlets, stuff and so on, they took a slice of the pie, New Zealand Herald, but in the small print, and this is what Sean Plunkett brings out, it said if you don't have enough content, Maori content, and you're not supporting the cause enough, we can call, recall the money we gave you. So what happens, they got trapped. So what happens is you get 200 grand from this fund, and you pay your debts and you think we're just out of war, they ring you up and say not enough content. 
How many know that the content on TV1 is actually getting, uh, of Maori content on the news is getting more and more and more? Come on. You don't listen to the news. Okay, well, this is good for, good for you. All right, if media outlets want a slice of this fund, there are strict conditions. You cannot present a point of view that opposes the government's race-based agenda. News must cover stories that support the government-approved narrative. Maori language and culture are now being forced into government departments, local authorities and state-funded media. What does it mean for dock and land? Transfer ownership and control of the entire conservation estate to tribal authorities. I own a beautiful piece of land in the Bay of Islands. And one of the reasons I got involved in this is because I received a letter. Well, I hope we don't run out of time because I'm going to be so mad if we do. <laughs> Should we have a right? I received a letter from Heritage New Zealand beginning of this year saying your land is being re reclassified as Wahi Tapu. I said, no, you're not doing that. They said, yes, we are. You can appeal in three years' time. <laughs> My, the value of that land has been halved overnight. It's a land grab. Then I found out that Otago farmers were being given letters uh, saying that there is something sacred on your land, so your land is being reclassified. 500 Otago farmers. Shoot! I am angry! Because I feel like I can't do anything about this. And I paid for that land. I worked for that land. I worked hard for many years to buy it. And it's been taken. That's not funny. Who sent you the notice? Heritage New Zealand. And who sent the notice to the farmers in the South Island? It's on my website. I've got the whole story. Just have a look on the story. The Department of Conservation has now opened what they've called the Options Development Group. This group has made a recommendation to give full control and governance to DOC, of DOC to Māori. Government rezones privately owned land and gives rights to it over Maori. I have to still pay the rates. Now people could walk all over my land. And they made up a story about bodies having to be dragged across my land. And I said, where's the proof of that? No, no reply. You can just make up a story. What does it mean for education? Rewriting New Zealand's history. Skipping the, the musket wars and pre-Maori history. Showing pre- and post-European Maori is different from what obse was observed and recorded by early Europeans. Teaching critical race theory. That basically is white people are bad, Maori are good. So my little kids are going to feel guilty for being European. This is so unfair. Don't pick on the kids. If you want to pick on anybody, pick on the adults, but not the kids. Teaching primary school children without Maori ancestry to feel ashamed. What does it mean for health? Two healthcare systems. One's already been launched. We know that. Maori health and care system, funded by the taxpayer. Decision making and veto rights over the entire health system. That's for all of us. Not just Māori, for all of us. What does it mean for justice? Two justice systems. A Māori court system where offenders with a Māori ancestry will be treated differently from other offenders. Two jail systems. Māori jails where inmates with a Māori ancestor will be treated differently from other inmates. Western common law replaced by tikanga. That's Māori customs and practices. See, Justin, uh, uh, see Justice Churchman's decision in 2021. You can Google that. People of Maori ancestry will have greater legal rights. What does it mean for water? Granting water rights to, uh, to uh, Maori water rights to all fresh water. Councils pay Maori for water. Water costs and rates will go up. Giving Maori funding to cover all legal costs to claim the seabed and foreshore from mean high tide out to 12 nautical miles. Opponents to Māori must find their, own legal, find their own legal costs. This is the thing. I've fought some battles to, 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 to fight for things. Māori get all their legal costs paid, we have to pay. What's that called? Apartheid! Come on, give me a clap for that one. It's called apartheid! Segregation. 
It's separatism. It's apartheid. You know, in the 1970s and 80s, we fought against apartheid. We were the country that was leading the world to stop apartheid. And now we're the great proponents of it. We're the guys who are actually pushing it. We need a riot. No, a revolution. Yes, a revolution, but let's start with a riot. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. I'd love you guys to get really wound up. The problem we have is Kiwis are too passive. The abolition of the right of local communities to hold a binding referendum on Maori ward seats on councils. Local government minister Mahuta is now un uh, uh, undertaking a review that appears likely to lead to 50% of the council seats being held by Maori. So, now we're on to, that's, that's basically what co-governance is, where we're headed. Now, I want to quickly talk about a very important topic, because if you understand what they meant by land in the Treaty of Waitangi, the actual three clauses of the, of, of the, the Treaty of Waitangi, if you understand what, what we mean by land, what I'm about to show you is going to unlock the entire Treaty of Waitangi for you, the, to understand it. Here is a very, very important historian, eminent New Zealand historian and former professor of history at Otago University, G.S. Parsonson, contends that Maori did not own land in 1840. This is what he says, direct quote from his book. This is not quite yet. They had no idea what owning land meant. He writes this. In the early contact period, the hapu were still hunter-gatherers. That is, they lived on birds, rats, shellfish, and fish and fern root. What they laid claim to or owned was birds, trees, rat runs or rat roads, par tuna or eel weirs, weirs and specific fern root patches. The saltwater hapu similarly claimed specific shellfish beds and specific shellfish spots where they knew they could catch snapper and hapuka. It follows that they did not own land as such as farmers owned land. They did not measure it. Divide it up, fence it, farm it year after year, pass it on to their children and their children's children. They had no need to do so, which perhaps explains why they were so ready to sell land to anyone who asked for it. In the last resort, land only became of value in the eyes of Maori when it could be sold to the Crown for resale to Wakefield colonists. And there's the reference. This is what uh, Stuart C. Scott, historian and lawyer, says in response to this. If when Māori signed the Treaty of Waitangi, they possessed, as Parsonson says, only fern and coomera patches, rat runs, eel weirs, and specific shellfish beds and coastal fishing spots, in addition to the sites of the paths and villages where they actually lived, then these and these alone, it could and should be argued, were guaranteed to them by the treaty. It would well be time that non-Maori New Zealanders taxpayers should raise the cry, we have been robbed. Can we have a clap for that? Because that is the truth. Now, Dr Muriel Newman writes this, she says, tribes did not lose land, Tribes sold 24.13 million hectares of New Zealand's total land area of 26.8 million hectares of subst for substantial amounts of money. Claims about land sales before 1840, about sales between 1840 and 1865, and, and sales through the Native Land Court, are merely claims for more money for those old sales. There's the reference. Now, I did the maths on this. 24.13 so is a percentage of 26.9, is 90%. So Maori had sold 90% of New Zealand in 18, by 1865. The other 10% was non-livable space like the Southern Alps. Conclusion, the land we are compensating Maori for has already been paid for, so we are paying twice, sometimes three or more times. Come on, how do you feel about that? That is not funny. That's called being ripped off. Not only this, here's an example. Say this was sold in 1860 for 10 pounds. For example, the Treaty of Waitangi claimants cite a house that was sold or land uh, to Maori, to, by Maori to settlers in 1860 for 10 pounds, which they say was way too cheap. 
They claimed and were given today's value, which is 800,000. So they were, or they were given by the Waitangi Tribunal. You know what? That tribunal's got to be disbanded. It's got to be just completely taken out. You can't have that there. Some Maori would sell the same piece of land several times over to different settlers simultaneously. Here's Dr. Bruce Moon. He says this. So in other words, Maori would say, here's a piece of land. You can have it for, 50, for five quid. Somebody else comes along. Yeah, you can have it for five quid too. You can have it for five quid. And there was five people who owned the same piece of land on the same day. An 1878 letter from Chiefs Ihaia Kirikumara and Tamati Tirawa stated that some Taranaki land had been sold three times and records exist in one case of five sales on the same day of the same piece of land. So here's the mother of all questions. Does the Treaty of Waitangi teach and instruct convey the idea that Maori would be self-determining having their own government? Just you decide for yourself. The treaty has only three short articles and here they are. The chiefs of the Confederation of United Tribes and the other chiefs who have not joined the Confederation cede to the Queen of England forever the entire sovereignty of their country. Does this article teach, instruct or convey the idea that Maori would be self-determining having their own government, yes or no? no. Come on, nice and loud. No. Come on, nice and loud. No, no. it does not. Now that is the that version up there is the from the the um, uh, from the Littlewood Treaty, which was the final draft, which was used to translate Te Tiriti, which was the Maori um, version. The Maori version is actually the version we should all be working from, but we're not. But that is the English that was used to translate into Maori for Te Tiriti. So these Article 1, the answer is unanimously no. There's nothing in there whatsoever. In fact, here is Sir, Sir Aparana Nata, who was perhaps the brightest Maori that New Zealand's ever known. He got a law degree in two years, and he was maybe, uh, uh, pr probably the brightest Maori that we've ever known. He was a famous Maori politician. He knew Te Reo like the back of his hands, and this is what he said. These are few, but few. He's talking about the first article of the treaty that we've just read. He said, these are but few words, but they indicate a complete session. This was the transfer by the Maori chiefs to the Queen of England forever of the government of their lands. And it is the absolute authority over the people which the article transmits into the hands of the Queen and Parliamentary Council. The main purport was the transferring of the authority of the Maori chiefs for making laws to the respective, their respective tribes and sub-tribes under the Treaty of Waitangi to the Queen of England forever. Now, i got five minutes, so here we go. Forever. That means that forever, there is only one government. Not two. So the whole basis of, of co-governance is fraudulent. And that's coming from the greatest Maori we've had. But the chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes and the other chiefs grant to the Queen the exclusive rights of purchasing such lands as the proprietors thereof may be disposed to sell at such prices as may be agreed upon between them and the person appointed by the Queen to purchase them. Is there anything in there that, that talks about you have your own government? No. no. Absolutely nothing. Okay, I've got two minutes. Here is the final clause of the Treaty of Waitangi in return for the cession of their sovereignty. That is, complete sovereignty forever. Not until 2022. Forever. Does this article teach in return for the cessation of their sovereignty to the Queen, the people of New Zealand shall be protected by the Queen of England and the rights and privileges of British subjects will be granted to them? Absolutely nothing in there about self-governance. Have I got one minute left? What the treaty actually said. It said this, we all have equal rights. All the people are under one government. One person, one vote. We all have equal responsibilities, pay taxes, obey the law, respect authority and so on. This is the British way. In the treaty, no one is to receive special privileges. To Hobson and the Queen, separatism would have been inconceivable. 
So right now the treaty is being trashed and so is New Zealand. So here's a call to action. This is what we should do. This is what I'm, I want to organise a march for 20,000 people to, on Parliament just before the election. Yes. Are you in? Come on, are you in? You need to be in. You need to be in. You can't. You can't clap and not come. No, you can't do that. You've got to, you've got to be there. In fact, book your flights. I'll set the date. Repeal all race-based legislation. We need to put pressure on Luxton. Huge pressure on that man. We need to put the screws on him. He's got to kick this out. He can't sit on the fence any longer. He has got to crack this. Two minutes, thank you. We're nearly done. You're so good, Teresa. Let's give Teresa a clap. Come on, Teresa. Launch, launch a Royal Commission to investigate a trail of treaty of, of Waitangi fraud and corruption. That's the first thing we need to do. Vote for the party which is going to completely outlaw co-governance, not just tinker with it, rearranging the deck chairs, which is kind of like, I don't know what Luxton's up to, but I don't have a good feeling. March on Parliament in 2023, only a show of solidarity will force our politicians into solid policy legislation commitments and outlaw co-governance. Votes speak most loudly, so only a visible demonstration of voter abhorrence of co-governance will affect real political change. Ladies and gentlemen, the little card that I gave you, don't lose it. Get on my website and I'll advertise to you and let you know how the march is happening, when it's going to happen, and I'll be taking names. So I, I, I pray that you guys get there and don't let me down, because if we turn up with 50, they go, nobody's interested in co-governance, let's push it through. Yeah. But if they have, to, you should have a card on you. Okay, new ladies are very naughty. You didn't do your job. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon, and hopefully we can come back and run a, a, a whole day seminar on this subject. Okay, God bless you. In fact, in fact, I'll ask you to do one thing, the very last thing. If you're committed to that march, stand up out of your seat now. Please, just stand up. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Come on.